Okay, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Jill. Thank you very much for um, uh, coming along to hear me speak tonight. Um, and oh, it's wonderful to have the countdown into the first slide showing. I'm assuming that when we get to one, it will then appear. Um, if it doesn't, I should then have to extemporise for a while. But let's see. Oh, no, there we are. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to talk about tonight was, um, as Jill has said, the results of some of the work that has been carried out by literally thousands of people over the last 10 years. <coughs> I will just apologise, I'm just throwing off a um, cough at the moment, so if I have to splutter every now and again, um, I'd just be grateful you weren't listening to me giving um, public lectures last Thursday or last Friday when it really was quite touch and go whether I was going to get through it or not. Um, but I'm much better now. Um, so, I'm going to talk tonight about um, the impact of the Black Death. Um, the, 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 the Black Death is, uh, was a watershed, really, the 14th century generally is a watershed in the history of Europe, um, during which a, a centuries-long period of sort of demographic and economic expansion on a general level um, had been on an upward line. This was thrown into reverse, really, by a succession of environmental, economic and epidemi epidemiological um, vicissitudes um, uh, dubbed by Barbara Tuchman uh, the calamitous century and with a certain amount of justification. Um, the most iconic of these was the Black Death. It wasn't the only problem, but it was um, particularly um, hard-hitting. Um, and is described by numerous um, uh, observers um, cataloguing uh, the, uh, the symptoms, um, the uh, discomfort of these, um, and the, <coughs> the plight of people affected by this. Um, and many of you will have seen these sorts of um, uh, quotations before. Boccaccio is a particularly vivid writer. Um, and um, the, the images of the, the dead dying in the streets, rotting where they lay and then heaped into the ground is something that um, is also reflected in some contemporary images. Um, Boccaccio, of course, is writing in Italy, um, but we see the Black Death also um, in England. Um, Barney Sloan recently has mapped the number of wills proved, for example, um, during the Black Death, which show a slight um, <coughs> lag from the actual period of death, the time of death, because it takes a while for the wills to be proved. But you can see at the top there this spike. Um, and we see um, uh, uh, catastrophe cemeteries in areas known, this is um, the Smithfield Cemetery, known to have been purchased during the period of the Black Death to bury the large numbers of people who required it. Um, and we have one or two of our own um, good uh, writers on the Black Death um, uh, describing, again, the same sort of picture. Um, uh, the, the notion here is even worse than the flood. Um, not obviously with the direct experience of this, um, the suggestion not even a fifth part of the people of the world, people were left alive. Um, and again, this, this idea that people weren't being buried, they were just thrown into pits. Um, and the, the account seems to be very consistent. It's strange then, perhaps, that for much of the 20th century, particularly the latter part of the 20th century, the impact of Black Death was really rather downplayed um, by archaeologists who... Um, tended to not find evidence for in places like the uh, deserted villages. This is Warren Percy, which many of you will know. Many of these places, massive villages, um, completely depopulated, but actually excavation showed that these hadn't been depopulated <coughs> after the Black Death, or not immediately after. Um, and it was also, the impact of the Black Death was also downplayed by a, a number of historians, um, uh, with memorable content, uh, comments, for example, from Bridbury, who described it as just a, a purgative. Um, uh, and, and the concept, the, the idea was really that it had just been a minor sort of perturbation which didn't really have any impact on social change, which was underway and would have happened anyhow. Recently, however, that um, the downplayment has been revisited, if you like, um, new perspectives on, horse, uh, on source material have led historians to raise their estimates of the likely um, Black Death mortality rates. Um, Ziegler in 1969 sort of went for between about 25 to 45 percent. 
um, Aberth in 2001 is suggesting 40 to 60 percent. Um, Hatcher and Campbell have also questioned its dismissal, and to some extent this reflects changes in the intellectual zeitgeist, really, I think, um, which is a little bit broad for me to consider now, but there's a move towards uh, uh, seeing um, uh, sudden events as being more significant. But we've also seen new um, scientific techniques coming in. Um, the paper by um, Kaki et al. is um, a, a DNA analysis. And the previous fact that archaeologists weren't finding these catastrophe cemeteries, and when they did find them, they weren't full of bodies tipped in in an advanced state of decomposed disarticulation. They were neatly laid out, as I showed you the slide just now. Um, but new techniques are enabling the DNA of the plague bacillus to be seen to be present in cemeteries where it was previously impossible to identify them as plague cemeteries because they weren't lying in heaps, they were neatly laid out. Um, the DNA work has also um, usefully demonstrated that it is um, plague that um, these um, populations were being stricken by. However, these advances in the understanding of the epidemiology and mortality of the Black Death has not and cannot alone answer wider questions about the longer term social and economic impact of the compound perturbations of the 14th century of which the Black Death was one. Um, the main problem is the lack of comprehensive, consistent, reliable and scalable documentary data on population. Um, the uh, documentary records, there are no censuses, of course, from this time. The documentary records we do have are either manorial counts, of which there are a relatively small number, um, referring to individual places, or they are global taxation data, um, which rather unhelpfully, the taxation system before the Black Death uh, was um, a financial, you were taxed on a percentage of the value of your movable goods, after the Black Death, the per capita poll tax is brought in, so we can't compare like with like when we're looking at taxation returns, and that's even, of course, assuming that taxation returns would be considered a reliable and true record. Um, the solution, or one solution, um, is the what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is um, tens of thousands of datable pottery shares which have been newly recovered, more recovered over the last 10 years anyway, from 2,000 known archaeological contexts in scores of historical settlements across six counties. The pottery here derive from more than 60 of these currently occupied rural settlements. That is the non-deserted settlements. Um, and the aim of this was that these are likely to be less atypical. Most medieval settlements did not end up being permanently deserted. So this data has come from the places that were not permanently deserted. The uh, method is um, standard for every single one of these 2,000 excavations. It's a one metre square. Um, it is dug um, in ten, each one is dug in 10 centimetre spits. Um, the spoil is oops, got out of order. Sorry, um, they, they are recorded on a pro forma basis. Each ten centimetre layer is planned uh, before it's dug, <coughs> um, and all of the soil is sieved. Or if it's very clay and can't be sieved, it's hand sorted through the same size mesh, a ten millimetre mesh sieve. Finds from each ten centimetre context are kept separate. Um, and to the end of 2015, as I say, more than 2,000 of these excavations have been completed. The test pits are cited wherever possible. Because they're in, within currently occupied rural settlements, um, it doesn't have the great ease of someone like Warren, where you've just got an entire empty landscape and you can dig wherever you think would be most suitable, or you can apply a sort of a rigorous sampling strategy of putting them in every 20 metres or whatever um, with an occupied settlements, you have to dig wherever you can. Uh, most of the test pits are in people's gardens um, and the excavations have all been done either by members of the public digging either in their own gardens or somebody else's or on bits of open land like playgrounds or roadside verges uh, within these villages or hamlets or they've been dug by teenage school children of which we've had more than 5,000 participate in this. And I do think there's a fitting irony, perhaps, that um, uh, a research paper that is talking about one of the great mass mortality events of, uh, well, of human history um, has been one of the great mass participation uh, research projects. 
Um, so the, the data I'm going to talk about and the data we've analysed is the pottery from these test bits. What we find is whatever's there. Um, but the pottery is the main useful uh, source of material for large-scale analysis, essentially because there's an awful lot of it. It's widely used in the medieval period. Um, it's very um, breakable. Uh, when it's broken, it is very difficult to mend because it's cheap, it's not worth putting the effort into mending it, therefore it gets discarded. When it has been discarded, it's taphonomically durable, it doesn't decompose and rot away. We know that in the medieval period people were using organic materials extensively, but those only survive in very rare circumstances. <coughs> Um, pottery is also immensely, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to see during excavation, it's relatively cheap to analyse as well, and I say relatively by contrasting it with something like DNA analysis when you're talking several hundred pounds a pop or um, radiocarbon dating, the same issue, pottery can be dated in large numbers um, much more cheaply, much to the chagrin of the people who do the pottery dating I'm sure. Um, the other great asset of pottery is that unlike animal bone, of which we also find quite a lot in the test pit, pottery changes form frequently, um, therefore, and that's why it can be easily dated. The unit of analysis that we use, that I'm using in this, is the number of pits that produce two or more sherds of pottery, um, comparing the two centuries before the Black Death with the two centuries afterwards. Um, the reason for this is that comparing the, um, uh, comparing the data with field walking data, it suggests that uh, two sherds is more from a single metre square is more than would be expected from non-intensive, non-settlement use such as manuring of arable. And to, to justify or to consider whether this is a valid unit of analysis, we can look at the other ways that might have been done um, looking at four of our settlements and compounding, aggregating the data from all of those, we can see if we look at the change in the total number of sherds from all of the pits, so all of the pottery from all of those four settlements, uh, there is a decline, a decrease of 76%. If we look at the total weight of sherds, bearing in mind a sherd is a broken bit and you can go easily from having one sherd to having four just by stamping on it. Um, if we look at the weight of sherds, uh, the decline is by 60%. The change in the number of pits producing five or more sherds, so a higher threshold of, if you like, habitative um, human presence, uh, the decline is 64%. And in fact, the number of pits producing two or more sherds comes out at the lowest at 54%. Um, so the two plus unit of measurement, if you like, is giving us the most conservative estimates um, in terms of um, this change. Um, and it's worth bearing that in mind when um, I'm talking about the results shortly. Um, I do want to reiterate this at this point that the project, the test pitting project was not initially intended at all to look at the impact of the Black Death or the demographic crisis of the 14th century. The initial aim of it was simply to increase the number of currently occupied rural settlements from which archaeological data had been recovered and for which we could reconstruct their development over time, particularly their spatial development over time. I was interested in settlement forms and settlement plans. Um, and the aim was to uh, counter the bias that had previously been in favour of deserted settlements, which had until then received the lion's share of attention. So it was really just the study of currently occupied rural, rural settlements. Let's dig wherever we can, reconstruct their spatial development over time. Um, so the Black Death finding, if you like, was an incidental discovery, and I think that makes it particularly interesting because we weren't initially looking for it. So it did, however, become apparent very, very soon. One of the great benefits of working with the public was that after each um, episode of digging, particularly as this started off as a schools project with teenagers digging, they would spend two days digging their test pit, and then on the third day would come into the University of Cambridge um, to analyse the results and sort of find out a bit about going to university and get um, some experience of being in a university as part of raising their academic aspirations. Um, but as part of that, I would we would go through, we'd get them to 
say what they'd found, what date they thought it had been from what the experts on site had been telling them. And then I would do a sort of very on the hoof, off the cuff summary um, as we put all the information up on the maps. We'd have a PowerPoint and colour in the pits that had produced pottery of different dates. Um, as we were doing this, I would sort of just extemporise on what I thought the pattern was showing. Um, and Houghton and Witten here, which were two villages sort of now conjoined, but initially um, originally separate villages, um, this was the second site ever that we worked on in 2005. And that was the first time that in talking through the pattern that was emerging, it became apparent that there was a marked decline. Uh, the period of the 14th century, rather helpfully, is a bit of a watershed in pottery production. Uh, there were quite a lot of wares that um, sort of go from about 1150 to about 1350 and quite a lot that go from sort of 1350 to 1550. Um, so it is a good point to which to break that divide and you can compare it with the number of um, uh, the, the sort of later Anglo-Saxon period which goes from about sort of 900 to 1100. So you've got relatively standard sort of time units which is um, helpful. So this is Houghton Witten, this is the late Anglo-Saxon period. Oh, have I done with the pointer? So here we've got the church here, that's the church at Houghton. There's another church here at Witten, both medieval churches. Um, the river Great Ouse is here. So the settlements are both along the bank there. Um, now for all of the maps I'm going to show you, um, each white square is the location of one of these one metre square test pits. They are not, I would point out, shown to scale. Um, they would be extremely informative if they were, but it would take a lot longer than two days to dig. Um, each, uh, if, for each of the historic periods, and the historic periods are detailed up here, so this is the late Anglo-Saxon period, sort of 9th century to 11th century. Um, uh, for If the test pit hasn't produced any pottery of that date, it's shown as a white square. If it has produced pottery of that date, it's shown as a circle, with the circles in different sizes depending on the number of sherds that have turned up. If they've come from layers where, uh, from spits where there's later material mixed in, the circles are grey. If they've come from layers where there's only pre-modern pottery, then the circles are black. Um, and so you can see here, late Anglo-Saxon, there's obviously a little sort of core of activity, it looks like a little nucleated village perhaps here, they're actually not that much going on around the church, uh, with not nearly so much going on. Um, so that's just background really into the high medieval period, um, this is the period between sort of the Norman conquest really and the Black Death. Um, we can see nearly all of the pits producing pottery. There's clearly a large compact nucleated settlement here. Witten, again, has uh, grown all of the test pits around here producing um, large amounts of pottery. And although the largest circle is the... Oops, sorry, I've lost the scale, haven't we? Um, although the largest circle is the five sherds or more, in many cases, these, these biggest circles will be producing 20, 30, 40 sherds in some cases. And then we go into the post-Black Death period. And you can see from that why, when I was looking at the data, first of all, as we covered this in, the immediate thought is, well, goodness, there's been a huge decline here. Um, you can see the centre of the village here really seems to have been very much hollowed out. One of the two, well, a couple of the pits just producing tiny little sherds. One sherd of less than five grams is a tiny, tiny amount of pottery. Um, a, a real hole in the middle of the settlement. And Witten, again, very extensively depopulated. So we saw this in, I would say, then we could see the post-medieval recovery. Interestingly, even into the post-medieval period, the, uh, the recovery isn't as strong. If you go back to the high medieval period, you can see the settlement is really much more extensive than it is into the post-medieval period when it really seems to um, be more um, compact and, yes, not quite as dynamic anyway. And this is including all the sort of glazed redwares that are very easy to spot and found in large numbers and you're really into the period of the sort of Industrial Revolution when you get to the end of this period and sort of Staffordshire slipwares and so on. Um, so this, uh, in fact, the figures for Houghton and Witten, by the time we'd excavated 37 pits in the village, 23 of them had produced two or more sherds of high medieval pottery, but 14 fewer had done so for the post-Black Death period, a drop of 61%. 
Um, this was obviously very interesting for Houghton, and when he then saw it happening again and again, and in 2010, I pulled all this together for the first time for a seminar, uh, series of seminars on crises, at which I was uh, had offered to speak at the one on the 14th century, and pulled all this data together because I found out again and again been saying, oh, we've got a you know late medieval decline here. Um, Aggregating all of this together, I'm sure you can't see the details of the figures, but what you can maybe see, the way this spreadsheet works, is a negative figure shows in red. And what you can see very clearly when we're looking at change over time, when we're looking at the column, which is the change high medieval to late medieval in the number of pits with two or more sherds, you can see all of these, nearly all of these sites are going red. Not all of them, and I will come back to that later. Um, when we pull the data together, in fact, 90% of the settlements we've dug in show a decline in the number of pits producing two or more sherds of pottery. And overall, the number drops when we add up all of the pits across the whole region, the number drops by 44%. At one point, it is about 44.7% is the current. As you would imagine, it sort of shuffles up and down a little bit from year to year, but rarely by more than a percentage point. 44% then is the impact of the Black Death, or is it? The obvious question, of course, has to be, is the pottery actually showing demographic change? And there are a number of factors that make me think that, yes, we can use the pottery as a proxy for population in this case. There is, for example, no evidence for decline in per capita pottery use in the late medieval period. There certainly is a change in the type of pots we get. Um, there's a move away from, in the, in the pre-Black Death period, uh, most pottery is cooking pots. Um, there's a move in the post-medieval period, uh, sorry, post-Black Death period, um, to greater use of metal cooking pots. But potters are resourceful and start making a wider range of tablewares. So we still see pottery use carrying on at a significant rate, at the same rate as far as we can tell. We can't say that people are moving away from using pottery, and that's what's causing the decline. Another factor which could have perhaps accounted for the drop in pottery, other than um, population change, um, would be a change in disposal of the pottery. Um, is it being buried in rubbish pits, for example? Is it being taken out to the fields? If you're using the same amount and it's not turning up in the settlements, what's happening to it? It's got to go somewhere. It doesn't rot away. Um, certainly, though, when we look at field walking, we see that actually, when we look across the fields, there's a decline in the amount of pottery there as well. This is recent work done by a community group, in fact, in Wimpole, in Cambridgeshire. This is the high medieval pottery, showing the focus of the settlements there. So, Wimpole is a national trust the property that some of you may know. Um, when we look at the late medieval, we can see not only the impact of the uh, Black Death on the, well, the 14th century on these settlements, but we can also see the decline in the amount of pottery out in the fields as well. There is no increase in pottery in the fields. And we see this again and again and again and again when we look at the field walking. So we can't use the changes in pottery disposal. There's also no evidence for uh, rubbish pits on the edge of medieval rural settlements. Um, we don't see that as an explanation for why we're not finding the material. Another factor which suggests that it's, it is about demographic change and the pottery is not um, some other reason is that the pottery from the test pitting does show a zoning within settlements. If, we'd have been, if we had had just a simple cultural move away from pottery use, we'd expect to see an overall decline in the settlements in the amount of pottery that's turning up. But we don't see that. The pottery is zoned with some locations continuing to produce pottery, while others nearby do not. So just as one example of that, this is Great Shelford, just near Cambridge. Uh, you can see here in the high medieval period, this is the church at Great Shelford, um, you can see in the high medieval period, a lot of the pits are producing pottery, including up in this area here, up in high green. In the post-Black Death period, we can see these areas are almost completely depopulated, as is the very stead area here, while the village in this area clearly carries on in occupation. 
So we do see this zoning. It's not a general diminution in the amount of pottery. And of course, using just two sherds as well as a threshold also means that if you're using some pottery, that's going to show up. But nonetheless, the significant point really is the zoning here. Um, the final point that um, makes me confident that we can use the pottery change as this demographic indicator is that we see a correlation with the historical data. Um, now, while the estimates for short-term Black Death mortality have ranged hugely, and in fact, if you look at individual manorial accounts, the um, individual mortality rates range from zero to 100%. It is difficult to think of a greater possible range. Um, uh, they average somewhere between 30% to 90%, which is a fairly broad range. But generally, there's a consensus that somewhere around about 35, 40, 55% is probably an approximate average. Our decline in our villages of 44% sits comfortably within that broad um, range. Now, you might think it'd be relatively easy to sit comfortably within a range that's quite that broad, um, but another good corroboration is another correlation with the historical data, um, which shows, for example, that there's a very strong correlation between the distribution of poor taxpayers and of areas where there's an excess of people seeking work as arable workers over the amount of work available. This is research that's been carried out by historians like Bruce Campbell and historical geographers like Richard. Richard Smith. Um, they show, for example, it's a very high rate of these poor workers, uh, these poor peasants in Norfolk, an area which, as you'll see in a minute, has very, very high rates of, popular, of pottery drop as well. And this, these correlations are useful because the historical and archaeological data are validating each other. And that's very useful because, of course, they're both affected by very different biases. So our inferential um, loop is not a circle. It's cutting that circle because we can test one form of evidence against another form. So I think our question, is pottery showing demographic change? I think we can say yes. It is reasonable to infer that the most likely reason for the change in pottery uh, volumes is a change in population. We can use pottery as a proxy for population. And in that case, the test pitting evidence is providing us with evidence for post-black death change, which is both measurable and mappable. And when you look at it like that, it really is dramatic. Perthen in Hertfordshire is perhaps the poster boy um, for this. Um, it's had over 100 pits have been excavated altogether. The local community took over from one of the school um, projects there and really got to grips with, I think, 115. They've now decided they're going to stop and write up. Um, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit um, and just allude to the fact that the Black Death is not the only crisis that test pitting is potentially capable of identifying. This is the Roman period, and you can see we've got a large Roman settlement up in this area, something going on down here, but nothing where the existing settlement is today. Into the uh, early Middle Anglo-Saxon period, this Roman village um, disappears. There is one sherd of Middle Anglo early Middle Anglo-Saxon pottery has come from the whole of those 115 test pits at Purton. Um, into the late Anglo-Saxon period, we see the village reformed on rather a different footprint, less em emphasis here, uh, a big focus in this central area. Um, there is a church in this area, a late Anglo-Saxon church with a cemetery that turned up during um, uh, development work, not in one of our test pits. Um, there's very little going on around the church and the modern Bailey Castle. There's a slight frustration. This is all scheduled. This is the one area we can't do any test pit digging. It's uh, ironic now that this is the bit of Perth and we know less about than any of the rest of the village, really. Leaving that aside, though, um, we can see into the high medieval period, this is in North Hertfordshire, Perton, uh, we can see how incredibly densely that settlement is. Um, the historians, historians estimate that the population of England grew perhaps um, threefold, perhaps tripled between approximately the period of the Norman Conquest and about 1300, the eve of the uh, 14th century. Um, and we can see that very strongly reflected here. Perton is 
looks crammed full, really, when you look at that map. When you look post-black death, the change is... Uh, the other one or another interesting thing is we can see extension in this area as well. Uh, the church is uh, 12th century, more early 13th century. The Morton Bailey Castle is also 12th century. We can see the village expanding in this area when the new Norman law sort of starts to develop and expand the settlement, but it's clearly not the only area that's growing. When we look post-black death, we see the impact of that, that decline. And that's very, very dramatic. It's a 76% decline at Purton. And you can see that the village is just... Well, I mean, decimated would be putting it mildly because that would be just one in ten, and this is much, much higher. The, the village is, is cut away. Entire streets completely depopulated these areas around here. It's collapsed really probably into a series of um, isolated cottages or farmsteads. And picking out individual zones, um, again, this area down here is, is, again, almost completely disappeared. And rather like at Houghton, even into the 16th, 17th, 18th century, when recovery occurs, we're not seeing... Um, that density of population is indicated by the pottery that we saw in the high medieval period. Um, we can see this at other places. I mentioned Cottenham already. Here we've got the number of test pits with two or more sheds drops by 79%. Um, and that's suggesting that the impact of the difficulties of the uh, 14th century are even greater than the historical evidence has indicated. Um, this is the place where uh, historians have suggested, despite the fact that um, a, a large proportion of the tenants died in the Black Death and documented as dying in the Black Death, there are still abandoned properties recorded in the 16th century. The VCH still suggests that the settlement suffered no overall shrinkage. And that, of course, is because today there is no sign of any shrinkage in Cottenham. It's all built up. Um, what we see here is, again... Uh, a massive decline in the number of pits and whole areas, particularly this area up near the church where we've probably got a um, either probably just post-conquest settlement laid out over these long narrow troughs, probably over ridge and furrow. We can see it's producing high medieval pottery but nothing post-medieval, uh, late medieval. Um, uh, Wiverton, a uh, completely different area up in North Norfolk near Blakeney, of the 23 pits excavated there, uh, the number of pits producing two or more sherds drops from 11 to just four, um, a third of previous levels. Um, and we can see the way these settlements are contracting. So this is before the Black Death. We've got a long linear settlement extending for four or 500 metres up the street here. The church is right in the south end here. Um, so it's that isolated um, settlement up the top there. And we can see after the Black Death, this has collapsed back again, all of this area collapsing back really to a sort of couple of clusters around the church. And these figures are by no means the worst at places like Gaywood and Paston. Many of you will know the Paston letters. Um, the drop is around 85%. So these are just some examples of devastation on an eye-watering scale. Um, within settlements would previously have been considered the successful ones, the ones that didn't end up being deserted. Remember, these are not the DMVs, not the deserted medieval villages we've been digging in here. And calculated using an index, that two or more sherds per pit, which may well be producing conservative estimates. Um, this is a graph showing the percentage of excavated pits that are producing high medieval pottery with an average of around about 40% of all of the pits excavated produce two or more sherds of high medieval pottery. And this is the graph after the Black Death. On average, 21% of pits produce two or more sherds, roughly half. Again, that 44% figure coming, um, coming through. Um, and I think what they're really showing is the extent to which our existing maps of late more medieval settlement depopulation and contraction, uh, which considered in many, continued in many places well into the 17th century, has been underestimated. Uh, look, because, of course, we can map this. We can map it at any scale. I've shown you individual settlements, individual streets, individual properties, which are de 
depopulated, if you like, if not depopulated, and I would contend that the two, one is showing the other. But we can see this uh, as a map here. So here we've got um, the central part of the region. Each of these um, place names is one of the places we've dug in. Central part of the region full of these very densely uh, packed settlements. Here's Purton that I was just showing you. Um, Houghton is here. Um, this is a bit, Binham is up here. Oh, well, Wiverton is there. Binham I mentioned, I mentioned is there. Um, this is before the Black Death, and we can see the impact. Just keep your eye on this area, which seems to be so very, very uh, um, vibrant, successful, dynamic, and is also an area where there's a large number of these very poor uh, peasants, because that's what happens after the Black Death and the two centuries after that. We can see this area is really very, very badly hit indeed, and so indeed is Norfolk. Um, there are a number of interesting phenomena to look at this. When we compare it, I, I've highlighted these sites as green. These are the settlements that actually don't show contraction. I said that 90% of them did. There's a very small percentage, 10%, which uh, don't show contraction, which actually grow. Interesting, you can see the area there in Thorny. I have to confess, I simply don't understand. Um, it's right out in the middle of the fens. Um, there's an abbey there, there maybe something going on, I'm not sure. Thorny is confusing. Um, Cheddarston um, shows, uh, uh, that should be green actually, Cheddarston grows, but there's a, medieval, a late medieval pottery kiln now, which is skewing the evidence. Um, these places, though, are, um, are different, and I'll come back to them a bit later. Um, because what we can do is compare the areas which are suffering the greatest depopulation with the distribution of known deserted medieval villages. Now, there are a number of issues around the desert, mapping of deserted settlements, but nonetheless, um, this map shows most of those that have been defined as um, deserted medieval settlements. Um, when we... About, yeah. So what we can do here is we can put on, sort of this is the area really where you've got the greatest um, decline in our test pit data, um, leaving out the sort of thorny Fenland area, which doesn't seem to do too badly, and Essex and quite a lot of South East Suffolk, which also seems to do um, much less badly. When we put those two together, we can see there's actually really quite a strong correlation um, and of course, when we put all of them together, the picture becomes very dynamic. We really are, I think, only seeing the tip of the iceberg. If we're looking at the distribution of deserted medieval villages, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Now, there are a number of observations that I'm just going to make um, in some of the patterning of this. So, um, and I'm going to look at the questions of the relationship between nucleated and deserted, uh, sorry, that should say dispersed settlement, um, nucleated versus dispersed settlement, settlement status, urbanism, selective zoned abandonment, and regional patterning. So when we look at the impact of deserted settlement, this is interesting because we see that the contraction doesn't just affect the nucleated villages. And this is significant because for a long time it was assumed that the nucleated villages had been particularly badly impacted by late medieval demographic decline. They were the most tightly packed, most densely inhabited, and they had an agrarian farming regime that required a large number of people to work on the land to keep it going with a sort of shared out parcel of land. But we can see when we look at somewhere like Clave Ring, for example, in Essex. Again, there's a large decline there. All these outlying places that are producing um, pottery in the high medieval period, so this we see high medieval before the Black Death here, are not producing po late medieval pottery there at all. All these greens and ends appear to be um, as badly affected as the heartlands of villages like Purton. Um, overall at Clavering, there's a decline of 38% using our same uh, 2 plus uh, measure. That decline is fairly grim, nearly 40%, but not nearly as bad as somewhere like Carlton Road. Um, you can see the same pattern again, um, the uh, high medieval compared with the late medieval, the church at Carlton Road incidentally is there, which is quite an interesting question in its own right as to why there's some um, uh, it's not actually until the post-Black Death period we get any pottery really at all turning up near the church and not really until the post-Med that we get any significant amount. Um, but the decline at Carlton Road is 62%. 
and it includes these outlying places, these outlying farms strung out in the landscape that are su suffering just as badly um, as the sort of uh, long straggly settlement in that area. Um, another phenomenon I was interested in was this question, well, why do some settlements actually not do as badly? Is there any relationship between um, the economic base of the settlement? Is there some link between the very agricultural base of a lot of the Norfolk settlements and the more urban um, underpinnings of many of the Suffolk settlements, which is sort of renowned as a sort of county of small market towns in the medieval period? Um, interestingly, though, we would look at someone like Clare, um, Clare had borough status from at least the, in the Doomsday Book, it's recorded with Burgesses, um, but it sees a decline of 50%. So here we see the high, late Anglo Saxon period, we see the village growing, or town uh, growing in the high medieval period, and again contracting away um, with areas left blank there. Um, in Norfolk, we see places like Acle and Binham, both of which had markets granted by the 13th century. Acle declines by 45% and Binham, which you can see here, by 71%. And that's in spite of the fact that Acle is nestled in the ideal commercial zone, if you like, uh, between the coast and the major medieval city of Norwich. And Binham is very close to the medieval shrine at Walsingham and has a major um, priory as well, of which you can see the remains there. Uh, but as you can see here again, you've got uh, dense settlement and almost complete depopulation. Again, this zone depopulation. Um, another um, point, though, is when you look at the settlements that don't decline, the ones that do increase, there is quite a common theme that most of them do have a broader economic base, most of them do have a market role, and several of them are heavily involved in the cloth trade. So Nayland here, for example, um, we can see it appears from nowhere, this is the late Anglo-Saxon period, virtually nothing going on, high medieval period, lots and lots of pits producing pottery, late medieval po period, even more pits producing even more pottery. Nayland is known to have been very heavily involved in the wool trade. Another place that grows is Long Melford, again, very heavily involved in the wool trade, as was Clare. So there is not, that doesn't provide the complete explanation. And many of these are research questions for the future to drill down into these and see um, what factors are affecting um, how settlements fared now that we've got the basic method that we can find out what the actual trajectory was. We can look for um, causes um, by comparing different places. Um, <coughs> another um, pattern that's very noticeable is that, the, that when the zoned contraction occurs, it very much focuses on, it's very frequently see that it's a withdrawal from the most recently engrossed areas, the areas that have been most recently taken into use as settlement. So I've shown you Great Shelford before with the, um, uh, this is the high medieval and high green area, Berrystead, and then the um, shrinkage in these areas. But interesting that these are areas, this is the Anglo-Saxon pottery, these are the areas that are not producing Anglo-Saxon pottery on our particularly high green. is clearly a completely new foundation of the high medieval period that seems to be particularly selectively withdrawn from in the late medieval period. And we can also see um, a, a regional variation in that. I've already alluded to the fact that we've got um, patterning in the um, decline, the decrease, of central Cambridgeshire, North Hertfordshire very badly affected, Norfolk very badly affected, Essex and Suffolk less so. When you look at the county totals though, uh, and this is just a very crude um, sorting by county, um, and but you can see the difference. So um, and this gives you the total number of pits within each county, which varies quite a lot. Um, but nonetheless, it's a significant number for each one. The number with two sherds before the Black Death and afterwards. We can see the drop is 51% in Bedfordshire, 44% in Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire coming bang on the average there. Essex um, doesn't do quite as badly. Hertfordshire does very badly. Norfolk does very, very badly. Suffolk, just 12%. So there's some really interesting questions to be drilled into as to what's going on here, what's causing, what, what is making some of these places more resilient than others? Why are people moving into them? Why are they surviving as going concerns? What, what is going on? Now that we can see what's actually happened, we can look for the um, explanations in a more informed way. So to conclude, um, 
We can say, I think, with confidence that the test pit excavations can reveal quantifiable changes in medieval demography. Um, scholarly debate, as I said at the beginning of my talk, has a surrounding the long-term impact of the perturbations of the 14th century and its climactic Black Death has long been hampered by the lack of a standard before and after data. Um, but the data presented here do show, I think, that we can get information that can be both mapped and measured um, from, uh, which is sort of liberating us, if you like, from the confines of a do documentary record that is finite. Um, nobody's writing any new medieval documents, whereas they are making new discoveries in terms of medieval archaeology. Um, and in many cases, the documentary record is entirely absent. Many of the small places that you've seen on many of these maps, the individual streets are not named in medieval documents. Many of the outlying settlements that you see in some of those dispersed patterns are not. We have no knowledge from the documents of who is living there. The taxation returns are aggregated up by man, and we don't know who's living where within those in most cases. Um, we can say, I think, with some confidence, that the pottery using population across the sixth of England was around 45% lower in the centuries after the Black Death than before. Pottery is obviously picking up long-term sustained changes in population because pottery wears carry on and use for a long time, but the, the dramatic difference is very, very telling. And we can actually say with some confidence that we've got about 45% uh, drop. And significantly, I think, which is really exciting, we can actually identify exactly where in the settlement landscape this is happening, and we can scale this as well. Uh, my next job, when I have some time and some money, is to get all of this information onto a GIS link database, because we can then zoom in and out of it and do a lot more in the way of statistical analysis, and I think that will be hugely exciting when we get to that stage. Um, What's really, really exciting, though, is I think this work shows that there's an almost unlimited reservoir of new evidence still surviving out there. Um, you look at a village like Purton, and you look at the maps I've shown you, and you would probably make a mental note never to buy a house there, because it's clearly been hollowed out and is going to suffer terribly from subsidence. But actually, these, these are only metre square pits. All of those 100-odd pits from Purton would fit within a 10 metre by 10 metre trench. You could probably fit them within this room. It's an immensely economical form of investigation, but it's also very adaptable. You can fit them in almost anywhere because they're very small. And therefore, this is an activity that can take place almost anywhere. Any individual community can actually go out, do some test pit digging, and compare its own trajectory, its own fate. How did it do during the Black Death with these overall figures, with regional figures, with next, with next door neighbors? Um, when we were at Purton, we had um, a couple of years after we started work at Purton, um, the neighbouring village of Shillington wanted to get involved. They emailed me. We couldn't bring them in at that time. And then there was an opportunity came out with some research council money to do some work in Shillington. And one of their main uh, drivers was to see how they'd done compared to Purton. Um, you can do that. You can actually get this data from absolutely anywhere because it's just sitting out there. <coughs> And of course, this potential extends well beyond Eastern England. Uh, we've got um, groups in um, Leicestershire, in Hampshire, in Derbyshire, up into Yorkshire, in Lincolnshire, who are now starting work on this and are producing results, which again, already can be compared with the East Anglian data. It will be very, very interesting to see if there's regional variation. We, we've got a good grasp on our benchmarks of what's good, bad, and mediocre, as it were, for East Anglia to get those similar benchmarks. The absolute volumes of pottery may well be very different, but we can get those similar benchmarks and then compare other places against them from that. And of course, it's not just an English thing. Um, the Black Death um, swept across Europe, um, uh, spanned 7,000 miles, really, probably from China um, to Ireland. Um, and this same technique could conceivably be used anywhere 
Um, uh, Bruce Campbell has been sort of writing recently, will be publishing um, next year, I think, on the, the big span of history and how the, the events of the 14th century, the changes of the 14th century, have actually impacted on uh, sort of east-west development since then, and I've heard him speak about this, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing him getting that into print, because the these are not events that are locked in the past. One thing leads to another, as I will um, produce a clean variation of the Alan Bennett quote from History Boys. Um, there's no cut-off point when things stop having an effect. This is a process that affects our lives today, affects the communities that we all live in today, affects their physical geography, their space as it is today. And it's potentially actually not just a sort of um, landscape exercise either. It's sobering to consider that the Black Death, which, given that there were, of course, a number of setbacks in the 14th century, but the Black Death, with its mass, well, 44% uh, population uh, decline, sustained population decline, is um, the major one. It's sobering to consider that this was caused by plague. We now know that from the DNA analysis. This is a disease that is still endemic in some parts of the world um, and could become a major killer again should resistance to antibiotics spread. Now, I've been saying that for some time, and it's not me that's invented the notion of antibiotic spread. This has been uh, reported on from time to time for a long time now by people who are very worried about resistance to antibiotics. Nowadays, should you catch plague, uh, it is treatable successfully with antibiotics. Um, it was ironic when I woke up this morning um, to the Today programme coming on the radio that the second item on the news was yet another story about the spread of antibiotic resistance among pathogens. Um, and this is from the BBC's website this morning, today, um, with doctors getting increasingly concerned. Uh, the world is on the cusp of a post-antibiotic era finding bacteria resistant to drugs when all other treatments have failed. Um, so this is not something that's locked in the past. I don't want you all to go away terribly worried about this. Um, <laughs> but um, I do want to highlight that this is, this is not something that's just locked in the past, but our understanding of these processes and indeed of the resilience, because the, the optimistic takeaway story is that human civilization didn't collapse, actually, in the wake of this. I hope that our populations in the future, should they be faced by something similar, can be equally um, uh, long-term resilient, not that it wasn't dreadful for most people at the time. So, thank you very much for listening to me talk about this. Um, as I say, the main thing I wanted to highlight was the fact we can now measure this impact, and we can do that anywhere. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>